Good afternoon. My name is Susan Derwin, and I am the director of UC Santa Barbara's Interdisciplinary Humanities Center. Our center serves as the public face of humanities for the campus, and our, and our programs aim to deepen our understanding of the challenges we face as local and global citizens and prepare us to address those challenges in informed, impactful, and compassionate ways. I'm very happy you have decided to join us for today's lecture, which is part of the IHC's public event series, Living Democracy. Throughout the year, scholars, activists, writers, and artists taking part in the series will examine the forces that weaken democratic culture and the conditions under which an equitable, vibrant, and just democracy can thrive. Before I introduce today's speaker, I want to make sure you are aware of the question and answer function on your screen. You can submit questions to our speaker in English or Spanish at any time during the event. And when our speaker concludes her presentation, she will answer as many of them as possible. I want also to extend our thanks to the Spanish interpreters for this event, Professors Viola Milio and Aline Ferreira, as well as to the ASL interpreter, Katie Voice. Thanks go as well to IHC Associate Director Aaron Nurstad, Assistant Director Adam Morrison, and Senior Artist Paula Schaefer, who work very hard to make our events run smoothly. And finally, our gratitude goes to the co-sponsors of today's event, the IHC's Harry Gervetz Memorial Endowment, the Department of History, and the Blum Center on Poverty, Inequality, and, and Democracy. In particular, I want to thank Blum Center Director Alice O'Connor, who suggested that we collaborate on bringing Elizabeth Cohn to our campus. Elizabeth Cohn is the Howard Mumford Jones Professor of American Studies in the Department of History and a Distinguished Service Professor at Harvard University. Professor Cohn received her AB from Princeton University and her MA and PhD from the University of California, Berkeley. She is the author of Making a New Deal, Industrial Workers in Chicago, 1919 through 1939, which won the Bancroft Prize, and A Consumer's Republic, The Politics of Mass Consumption in Postwar America. She is also the co-author of a widely used college and advanced pl placement U.S. history textbook, The American Pageant. Today, she will be presenting material from her most recent book, published last fall, Saving America's Cities, Ed Logue and the Struggle to Renew Urban America in the Suburban Age, which won the Bancroft Prize for 2020. Professor Cohn was originally scheduled to speak at the IHC last spring. Then the pandemic hit. Between then and now, she published a piece in The Atlantic that was the most moving analysis I have read about how our shared vulnerability to disease could serve as a point of departure for dealing with the coronavirus and the economic devastation it has wrought. It is an honor to welcome Professor Cohn to the IHC to present her lecture, Struggling to Save America's Cities in the Suburban Age, Urban Renewal Revisited. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm going to share my screen in a minute, but I just want to uh, thank you for coming, joining me today. It's, as you heard, it's taken a while for us to get together. I was originally supposed to be here in early May, but as I think about it, um, many of the issues that I want to talk to you about today haven't uh, changed. In fact, I think they've become more acute in our current crisis and current moment. And that includes the fate of our cities, the persistence of racial inequality and its costs, and the crisis of affordable housing for many Americans. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, let me also, before I dig in here, um, express my thanks uh, to my hosts, to the Interdisciplinary Humanities Center, uh, particularly Aaron Nurstad and Professor Susan Derwin for organizing my visit twice first uh, with airplanes and hotels, and then uh, virtually with Zoom. Um, I also want to thank uh, Alice O'Connor from the History Department. Um, Alice did me the great honor and favor of reading a very long draft of this book and giving me her brilliant insights and ideas, which made it a much better book, uh, and then inviting me to come and give this lecture. So, 
I'd like to start by giving you uh, some background on why I wrote this book. I am not a biographer. I am a social, political, and urban historian of the United States in the 20th century. And this is a very different kind of book from what I've written before. My previous books uh, were uh, ones that I wrote as a social historian. I was writing the history of groups of ordinary Americans, first and second generation immigrants, factory workers, Afri African Americans who had recently migrated to, uh, from the American South to Northern and Western cities, middle-class homeowners and consumers and so forth. That kind of history historians refer to as history from the bottom up. So you might very well wonder why I have written a biographically oriented book about a powerful white male city builder like Ed Logue. Well, I first decided that I wanted to write a book on post-World War II cities that grappled with the changing physical built environment, as well as how that change came about. As I put it in the book's introduction, I aim to understand who's in charge, who should have a say, who benefits, and who pays the bill. I determined that focusing on the life of someone who was personally engaged with the struggle to revitalize Amer post-war American cities in a period when mass suburbia was booming would be a promising way to frame the book and to engage readers in what I thought was an important story. I consequently became attracted to the new challenge of putting an individual with influence at the center of my book to write, if you will, history from the top down, but to bring to that analysis, the social historian's concerns with the importance of social identities like class, gender, race and ethnicity, profession, and the like. Whoops, sorry about that. In my previous book, A Consumer's Republic, The Politics of Mass Consumption in Post-War America, I had written about the rise of mass suburbia as an increasingly important place of residence, of work, and of commerce after World War II. There I explored what I called the landscape of mass consumption, the carving of new urban, a new suburban housing developments out of farms and forests, and the rise of shopping centers at new highway intersections. In that book, I implied that cities were being displaced by suburbia, but that was not my primary subject of, of investigation. So when I set out to write what became eventually Saving America's Cities, I wanted to understand better what the decentralization of American metropolitan areas had meant for cities, particularly the older established ones that had thrived with industrialization and immigration in the 19th and early 20th centuries, but were now after World War II in decline. I also felt from the start that we had a limited, fairly simplistic understanding of how post-war American cities had developed based on essentially dismissing all efforts at urban redevelopment as disastrous urban renewal. That assumption seemed to equate all interventions with the work of villains like New York's notorious Robert Moses, who you see here. Um, and in contrast, the ideal for post-war cities was thought to be best articulated by the more saintly Jane Jacobs with the, her message of anti-planning, hands off, let neighborhoods and cities develop organically on their own, which often let market, service, uh, market forces prevail. Surely, I thought, the story must be more complicated than a clash of these two extreme positions. I certainly knew that urban renewal from the late 1940s into the 1970s had some very deep flaws, such as excessive demolition and dislocation of residents who too often were African-Americans and other minorities, a misguided belief that was inspired by the modernist urban designer Le Corbusier in the importance of separating residences, work, and retail, the imposition of car-oriented suburban schemes on downtowns, highways that went slashing through neighborhoods, and more. 
But on the other hand, I also knew that many American cities were truly in trouble by the 1940s and in need of help. After a decade and a half of first um, a devastating Great Depression, followed by the devastations of wartime, the deprivations of wartime, I should say, cities were bleeding people, jobs, and much more to the booming suburbs. And my final motivation for writing this book was that as a city dweller and city lover, I was getting increasingly alarmed about what I was seeing around me. The shocking deterioration of urban infrastructure, particularly roads and mass transit, as well as a worsening crisis in affordable housing almost everywhere in the United States, long before this pandemic, to the point where low rent apartments were fast disappearing, evictions and homelessness were growing, and more than a third of American households were paying over a third of their income on shelter. And in many places, LA being one of them, um, many people were spending at least 50%. Moreover, a drastic divide has developed between cities that are flourishing and cities that are failing. So we have haves and have nots among cities, not only within them. So I wondered, how did we get here? And those underlying conditions have surely contributed greatly to the troubled way that American society has experienced the COVID-19 crisis. I also wondered, where were the resources that once had made the United States a country with a highly functional mass transit system and well-engineered, up-to-date roads, bridges, and tunnels? And where was the commitment that had led the nation to at least assert in the Housing Act of 1949 a responsibility to provide, and I quote from it, a decent home and a suitable living environment for every American family, end quote. Might there not be something to learn from probing how we got to this place? So why Ed Logue? Well, I started looking around for an ideal subject uh, for my book and, and I had a checklist of the things that I thought would be important. Most importantly, I was looking for an individual whose life would allow me to tell two intertwined stories, how both a person and a nation went about trying to revitalize American cities and the mutual influence, good and bad, that they had on each other and on our cities. It didn't take me long to stumble upon Ed Logue. I actually had known about him from a course I had taught at Harvard on Boston's history. And I had you know, remembered that he had had a very important influence on Boston in the 1960s in turning around what was already a very deteriorated city. Soon, however, I discovered that Logue had left an enormous cache of papers at his alma mater of Yale, and that he had given many interviews over the years so that I could still hear his voice even though he was no longer alive. Um, I also discovered um, that no one else was writing a book about him, though other historians had considered it, and also that many of his associates uh, were still alive, were in touch with each other, and in fact had launched a website called The Friends of Edward J. Logue. In time, I would figure out that the span of Logue's career offered me an amazing way of tracking shifts in urban redevelopment over more than four decades, as Logue worked in New Haven in the 1950s, in Boston in the 1960s, in New York State from the late 1960s to the mid 1970s, and in the South Bronx from 1978 to 1985. And in the last 15 years of Logue's life, he taught courses at MIT, he ran a small uh, consulting business in urban development, and he tried unsuccessfully to write his memoirs. He left only one chapter, one draft chapter on Boston. Really, Ed Logue was a doer, not a writer. He died in 2000 on Martha's Vineyard at the age of not quite 79. So why is Ed Logue a compelling protagonist for this book? First, Logue grew up caring deeply about cities. He was born in 1921 and raised in Philadelphia, one of five children of a widowed kindergarten teacher who did not have many financial resources. So he went to Yale College on scholarship and Yale Law School on the GI Bill. 
And in New Haven, he became deeply engaged in the city, particularly with its working class residents, many of whom he knew from working in Yale's dining uh, halls when he was on scholarship and whom he uh, later helped to organize into Yale's first labor union. When Logue married Margaret Devane, who was the daughter of the Dean of Yale College, his roots in New Haven grew even deeper. I paint a portrait of Ed Logue as a complicated figure. He was loved and admired by some, and he was deeply disliked by others. And I argue that from his earliest days, he was most comfortable being what I describe, these are my words, as a rebel in the belly of the establishment beast. And what I mean by that is that repeatedly over his lifetime, Logue made his way into bastions of power and then fought hard to improve what he judged to be their damaging deficiencies. Second, Logue became committed to renewing cities as part of his liberal progressive politics. And that runs counter to many assumptions we often make about who urban renewers actually were. They are often portrayed as part of a pro-business growth machine that put corporate investment over people. Logue stood in stark contrast to that stereotype. He worked as a labor organizer, as I mentioned, and he trained as a labor lawyer. He fought McCarthyism and discriminatory quotas at Yale. He argued strenuously that white, not black America had a race problem to overcome. And he had no illusions that the private sector would do anything but prioritize profits over serving the public interest. In the late 1940s and 1950s, Logue thought that the problems of cities should be the next frontier of Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal, and that extensive federal dollars and expert know-how should be applied to the challenge of saving America's cities. A typical pronouncement of, of Logue's was, and I quote, the public sector created the new Boston and the public sector must control it, end quote. Third, Logue came to believe early in his career that physical improvements in the built environment could have larger social and political benefits. And he discovered this in a surprising place. Logue served as special assistant to Chester Bowles, the American ambassador to the new nation of India in the early 1950s and a former New Dealer himself. Uh, he, had, he headed Roosevelt's Office of Price Administration during World War II. In India, Logue observed the United States government and the Ford Foundation investing in what was then called community development, improving the physical infrastructure of villages. And here, I mean, they meant roads, wells, housing, schools, so forth in hopes of creating a more equal, a more democratic, and remember this is the Cold War, uh, a more anti-communist India. Logue subsequently brought lessons from what was then called the third world back with him to his work in first world American cities. And take note that this is not the usual direction of influence that we expect. Logue's time in the developing world was only the first example I should say of of him learning from and participating in a transnational circulation of ideas about architecture and city planning that was common after World War II. He was also inspired, for example, by European social housing, and later in his career we'll see by the creation of European new towns. And this was a strategy for creating new communities for work and residence in nations that had been devastated uh, by World War II. And fourth, upon return from India in the fall of 1953, Logue began a career in urban redevelopment that would unfold in four acts over four decades. As I follow Logue's personal story in the book, we see an urban renewal process that was not at all static, but rather continued to change over time, to experiment with different approaches, um, uh, uh, with different approaches in response to his own which often admitted failures, as well as to shifts in national policy and politics, and to implement some surprisingly progressive ideas. So urban renewal in my telling is not the one huge disaster of popular lore, but rather a much more complex evolutionary response 
to America's cities in crisis. Now, I won't take you through the details of a half century of history. You'll have to read the book for that. But I will give you now some highlights of Loeb's four acts in renewing cities. Act one is New Haven from 1954 to 1961, when Loeb teamed up with a newly elected reformed Democratic mayor, Richard C. Lee, to try to turn around a city that was in big trouble. Uh, here, there were failing older industries that were closing, um, while many successful companies were abandoning their original home of New Haven, leading to the, the disappearance of many good working class jobs. This was happening just as African-Americans were arriving from the South in hopes of making better, a better living in the industrial North. At the same time, middle-class white residents were moving to the suburbs in search of newer housing, better schools, and other aspects of modern living, in some cases quite explicitly fleeing a city that was becoming increasingly non-white. And finally, the new I-95 highway was threatening to bypass downtown New Haven. And that was, was a potential death knell uh, to New Haven's role as the retail center of its region. It was already facing competition from new suburban shopping centers that were cropping up. So the important point here is that cities like New Haven were truly struggling. Logan Lee's agenda consisted of tapping newly available federal funding from the Housing Acts of 1949 and 1954 to make New Haven a national laboratory, to, laboratory for physical renewal, as well as innovative social programs, many of which like Head Start, um, Neighborhood Legal Services, job retraining, would later be incorporated into LBJ's Great Society. And in the end, New Haven got more dollars per capita from the federal government than any other city, and it was widely viewed as ground zero for urban renewal. Now, Lee and Logue had some notable successes, but overall, this first phase of federal urban renewal in the 1950s turned out to be deeply problematic in New Haven and in most other American cities for many reasons that I explore in the book. Most egregiously to our eyes today, but logical uh, from their perspective at the time, the urban renewers here and elsewhere where tore down a poor but still viable low-income neighborhood to put up apartments that were aimed at keeping the middle class in the city. They constructed a highway to connect downtown to I-95 to ensure the city's commercial survival. And you can see that what was called the connector right here in the image I'm showing you. And they introduced a car oriented suburban style shopping center into downtown to try to beat their, their new competitors at their own game. And you see the, the, that shopping center in the image as well. I also probed the way that New Haven's urban renewers consulted with community residents. And I discovered that although they felt that they were being democratically minded experts who were protecting the general good, their approach sought input mostly from representatives of established interest groups and community organizations. And I call this approach pluralist democracy. And I draw that from the analysis that Yale political scientist Robert Dahl developed in his famous case study of New Haven's, or New Haven's urban renewal, which was entitled, Who Governs? So I conclude that this first phase of urban renewal during the 1950s with its massive clearance and pluralist democratic form of community consultation was deeply flawed. In New Haven, as well as in many other cities, including Boston, where the destruction of the immigrant West End neighborhood followed much of the same pattern. Act two, which is Boston from 1960 to 1967. Now in 1960, Logue was hired first as a consultant and then as head of a much expanded Boston Redevelopment Authority, which was known as the BRA by another new mayor, this time John Collins, who had ambitions to turn around his own near bankrupt and politically paralyzed city. In Boston, Logue learned from his mistakes in New Haven and those that had taken place under the previous Boston mayor, John Hines. Uh, that was the West End uh, disaster. Logue came in waving a flag of planning with people and he vowed never to undertake the kind of demolition that had happened in the West End neighborhood. 
I examined two dimensions of Loeb's work in Boston, the downtown renewal and the neighborhoods. The heart of downtown urban renewal was the creation of government center to revitalize Boston's stagnant downtown, to greatly expand jobs there, and to pressure a reluctant Yankee business elite to finally commit to the city that had been ignoring for decades. Instead, it was investing everywhere, this elite was investing everywhere else they thought they could make money. The government center story is a fascinating one where Logue and Collins made full use of the federal purse and federal power. As the Boston Globe wrote in 1962 in reviewing the just revealed and quite controversial city hall design, it is, and I quote from the Boston Globe, nothing but a wholehearted affirmation of a new time, new social needs, and a new technology and new aesthetics to, de to declare faith in the civic instrument of government, end quote. The architects of City Hall meant its avant-garde, so-called brutalist modernist design to send exactly that message about the integrity of government. City Hall is that low building right in the front of the photograph. As Michael McKinnell, who was one of the architects um, of, of City Hall put it many years later, he and his partners had, and I quote him, a tremendous feeling that government uh, was not just a benevolent institution, but was the institution for social change. City Hall should be the people's palace, the symbol of open government, end quote. Likewise, they intended the large open plaza that they put at the heart of government center to be the site of popular assembly and protest. Of course, they were, they and the city of Boston were only discovered later that this proved to be uh, a hopelessly windswept and alienating space. The Government Center project marked another crucial evolution, though, in Logue's thinking. Here, eventually, he came to recognize the importance of preserving some of Boston's historic structures, like the Sears Crescent, which you see on the left, and Quincy Market on, on the right, to create a mix of historic and modern buildings that still characterizes Boston today. He also learned that he needed to broaden the base of support for his program, and hence he sought a range of influential allies, including the Catholic Church. And you'll see here in this photograph uh, on the left, that's Cardinal Richard Cushing. Mayor Collins is in the uh, wheelchair. He had had polio and, and Logue next to him. Uh, they so he sought allies in the newspapers like the Boston Globe and retail store leaders um, like the presidents of Jordan Marsh and Filene's, the largest stores in Boston, local architects, and the integrationist oriented black middle class of Roxbury. And this is important, I think, because they could own homes in very few Boston neighborhoods. And hence, they welcomed Logue's attention to renewing their Washington Park neighborhood with open arms. And this comes to many of us as a surprise. Logue's efforts to revitalize Boston's other neighborhoods proved more contentious uh, than either downtown or Washington Park. But in the end, Logue learned that just as it was necessary to negotiate between the promoters of a modern and an historic Boston, so too he had to negotiate with key neighborhood groups to achieve his renewal goals. And I look at five Boston neighborhoods, uh, Washington Park and Madison Park and Roxbury, Charlestown, the South End, and the North Harvard area of Alston. What I discovered is that every neighborhood had its own story. Attitudes based in class and race played important roles, but the outcome proved much more complicated, varied and unexpected than our common assumption that urban renewal can simply be reduced to the stereotypical story of middle-class whites invading the neighborhoods of low-income blacks. Moreover, I argue that the course of, over the course of these years, through the urban renewal experience, neighborhood residents developed important skills of negotiating with city officials. Through what a participant observer, who was an MIT graduate student and later an MIT professor, Langley Keyes, at the time called the rehabilitation planning game. Ultimately, Boston citizens would apply these skills to gaining more affordable housing in their neighborhoods, 
and defeating the Southwest Expressway and the inner city highway projects in the 1970s. Communities experience of fighting urban renewal in the 1960s, I suggest, contributed to a new expectation for what a democratic process in city redevelopment must entail. As in other social movements like civil rights, anti-war politics, uh, feminism, grassroots participation became a requirement in cities. What I call participatory democracy marked a big shift from the pluralist democratic expectations for community consultation in the 1950s. And the photo you see here is one of my favorites. It's uh, of the North Harvard uh, area of Alston um, where there was tremendous pushback from the neighborhood to the BRA's plan. And, and interestingly, late in life, when Logue was for, for writing his memoir, he listed his, you know, what he considered his greatest mistakes. And the number one mistake, he said, was not negotiating with this Alston community. Logue was widely credited with bringing about the city's turnaround as the new Boston, but his Boston years ended with another surprise a failed effort in 1967 to run for mayor of the city when John Collins announced that he was stepping down. It quickly became, became, became clear, however, that uh, Logue was better suited for the administrator's back room than the mayor's front office. He proved a terrible campaigner by all reports, but he also suffered from a 10 person race where the front runner was school segregationist Louise Day Hicks which encouraged the opponents to her to rally around one candidate. And they selected the well-known secretary of the Massachusetts Commonwealth, Kevin White, who would become the next Boston mayor. And here you see uh, the headquarters for Logue's campaign in the neighborhood that in an area that was closest to that Washington Park neighborhood. Um, and it, it's quite clear that this was the only precinct that Logue won outright. Uh, very obviously a payback for um, the, uh, the uh, you know, a repayment for the support that he had given them through his urban renewal. Act three, New York State from 1968 to 1975. Logue's next act came about when liberal Republican governor Nelson Rockefeller was frustrated with the difficulty of getting New York State voters to approve bond issues to construct what he considered to be much needed subsidized housing. So he came up with an ambitious workaround, a statewide urban renewal super agency with enormous powers, and he hired Ed Logue to head it. It was called the New York State Urban Development Corporation, the UDC for short, and it was funded by a combination of state appropriations dwindling federal dollars, and in a unique move, bonds that would, were sold to private investors. In recognition of the difficulty of doing this job, Rockefeller gave the UDC and Logue enormous authority, including the ability to acquire property through eminent domain, and most controversially, to override exclusionary local zoning and outdated building codes which for, for a long time had helped to keep out affordable housing in many communities. Given the UDC's power to, um, to challenge local zoning, getting the New York State Legislature's support, approval of the UDC proved extremely difficult to secure. And it only came about reluctantly when Rockefeller rather cleverly used the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. as um, an argument for the need for what he said, a true memorial made not of stone, but of action. Uh, it should also be said that Rockefeller was very good at twisting arms and he did get the support um, eventually. The UDC had many successes. It built 33,000 units of housing over its six and a half years. It sought alternatives to both suburban sprawl and demolition style urban renewal by creating those self-contained new towns that I mentioned earlier on undeveloped land. There were two of them in upstate uh, New York and Roosevelt Island, which you see in the slide in the East River of New York City. And he planned them deliberately to be mixed income, mixed race and mixed age communities. UDC experimented with innovative architectural designs and building technology as well, such as 
low rise high density alternatives to the highly criticized high rise public housing that was very common at the time. The UDC put enormous emphasis on the quality of the architecture it built and the talent of the architects it hired. Determined to remove the stigma and cookie cutter approach uh, often attached to subsidized housing, Loeb sought a large stable of both high profile and up and coming architects. And in fact, Philip Johnson, who had done the plan for Roosevelt Island, helped out by inviting Logue and his senior staff early on to a party in his glass house in New, Can in New Canaan to introduce him to uh, the young crowd of New York architects. But the UDC successes did not last. All came tumbling down when Logue tried to build modest amounts of affordable housing in nine well-off Westchester suburban communities. Uh, what he called a fair share housing program. And you can, this is a meeting in Bedford and, and you can see from it, I hope how uh, unpopular the UDC's fair share housing program was. The UDC was also deeply affected when President uh, Nixon turned off the federal spigot and implemented a moratorium on all spending on housing as part of his new federalist agenda to reduce the role of the federal government. As a result, the UDC came to a dramatic collapse, including having bankers who handled uh, the bond sales accuse the UDC of putting its social mission uh, before its responsibility to investors. In February 1975, the UDC disastrously defaulted on notes and loans, and Loeb was forced to resign in great anger and frustration. As he put it, I quote him, it was too good to last. And that's why I so cordially dislike bankers. They feel threatened that I was engaged in, bankers actually said this, social engineering, as if that's a mortal sin. I was very proud of the fact that Roosevelt Island was a total piece of social engineering, end quote. The final act four, South Bronx from 1978 to 1985. You see a much older Ed Logue here. Loeb became president of the South Bronx Development Organization, which was known as the SBDO. This was Loeb's last major urban redevelopment job. And here he sought to rehabilitate himself after the UDC's spectacular failure, while he also aimed to rehabilitate one of the poorest areas in the nation. With less power, fewer tools, and a smaller amount of funding than he had ever had at his disposal before. Nixon's cuts in federal appropriations for cities and housing continued under President Carter, and then funding took an even deeper dive under President Reagan. Between 1981 and 1987, federal housing programs were slashed by two thirds, more than any other part of Reagan's budget. The federal government was clearly going out of the business of supporting urban redevelopment, and in its place was actively promoting uh, private market solutions. As president of the small, scrappy, underfunded SBDO, Loeb constantly scrambled for resources. And once again, he shifted strategy out of necessity, often seeking ways to take advantage of this new orientation to private market solutions by developing industrial parks and by partnering with private lenders to build housing. Logue's signature program there was Charlotte Gardens, which were, were 90 ranch style prefabricated single family homes constructed in the middle of one of the most troubled neighborhoods in New York City. They were heavily subsidized for purchase with the goal of attracting lower middle class homeowners to anchor uh, the revitalization of the neighborhood. And the idea was that multifamily rental housing would soon follow. To the surprise of many skeptics, Charlotte Gardens proved a huge success with hundreds of black and Puerto Rican Bronx residents. They were transit workers, security guards, firefighters, police officers, nurses, teachers, and so forth, eager to buy the kind of suburban style home that they either couldn't afford or wasn't available to them as people of color in New York's mostly lily white suburban communities. A few aspects of the SBDO period I think are worth highlighting. First, here Loeb clearly and regretfully abandoned his previous prioritizing of innovative architectural design, which had depended on public subsidy, in favor, as you can see, of conventional styles that would appeal 
to the more traditional tastes of local buyers and private funders. Second, Charlotte Gardens and other SPDO housing in the Bronx ultimately provided a blueprint for the more extensive 10-year Koch housing plan that followed, which would in fact add several hundred thousand units of housing to New York City's stock. And third, and most notably, after a long career of one could say paying lip service to his mantra of planning with people, here in the South Bronx, Logue actually did it. Working closely with community planning boards and neighborhood CDCs like the Mid Bronx Desperados, um, as he came to recognize how crucial they and their constituents were to achieving any success. In conclusion, let me just hit a few points that I think we can take away from to, for today from this deep dive into Ed Logue's career. First, over time, Logue learned a lesson that many liberal do-gooders and other policy realms learned, that the work of the urban redevelopment expert, this was a new profession that Logue himself had very enthusiastically helped to create during the 1950s and the 1960s, but he learned that it had serious limitations and that more grassroots participation by community members would greatly mattered. Today, many cities have learned that they must engage neighborhoods in development decisions. But I should add that sometimes this, the problem is the opposite, that how to avoid too much what we now call nimbyism, not in my own backyard, or to narrow a focus on one particular neighborhood rather than seeing uh, the city as a whole. Second, throughout Logue's career, he struggled to figure out how to create socially diverse communities by income, by race, and by age, which he felt was the best insurance that low and moderate income Americans who are often minorities would get decent and equitable services such as schools, transportation, and retail stores, as well as greater opportunities uh, in their futures. In a society where your residential address often dictates your life chances, and middle-class whites are often positioned to demand the best, Logue promoted socially integrated communities, but he frequently lacked the tools to do this. And still today, uh, we struggle with, I, I think, with the same problem. For example, how to keep existing residents in gentrifying neighborhoods, how to provide sufficient numbers of Section 8 vouchers for low-income people who want to move to better serve communities, or how to bring to a larger scale requirement that developers of market rate projects must include affordable housing units or contribute to building them elsewhere in the city. Third, uh, a hard, another hard nut for Logue to crack was how to involve whole metropolitan areas in solving the housing, schooling, and other problems facing low-income city residents. Logue fruitlessly tried to do this in New Haven and Boston. He got nowhere. And he hoped that finally, from his statewide authority at the UDC, he would be able to make this happen in New York. But in the end, that effort contributed to the downfall of both Logue and the UDC. And still today, I would say that metropolitan problem solving remains mostly elusive. Finally, and uh, I wanna say that probably the greatest disappointment and, and disillusionment in Logue's career was the decline in the role and responsibility of government, particularly at the federal level, for financing and revitalizing cities and subsidizing affordable housing. Over his career, Logue watched federal support steadily shrink and responsibility shift to the private sector, which he considered a serious mistake. He anticipated what we too often encounter today, think of the Amazon uh, headquarters sweepstakes, cities forced to make deals that in the end cost them in future tax revenues, undue burdens put on public services, and races to the bottom between cities to get that corporate investment when they all in the end lose out. And when it's not obvious how the private sector might profit, such as in building public infrastructure and civic spaces, too often much needed projects go unaddressed. Towards the end of his life, Logue said in sad resignation, and I quote him, the basic responsibility for subsidized housing for the low and lower income families is federal. It is everywhere in the developed world, used to be with us, end quote. Most importantly, um, even if we acknowledge that urban renewal was at best the proverbial mixed bag, 
I think we can still admire and seek to recapture the spirit of commitment and experimentation that propelled people like Logue, rather than content ourselves with accepting the very limited palette of possibilities that has come to dominate since the 1980s. In the midst of our current crises, that determination to make cities better for all is more needed than ever. As I write at the close of my book, and I'll quote myself to end, a better understanding of this history will hopefully reawaken from a long slumber the will and wherewithal to revitalize cities that still struggle for economic survival, to invest in neighborhoods still lacking adequate services, and to improve the prospects for those Americans uh, still poorly housed or in the worst cases, homeless. This would be the legacy of urban renewal that Ed Logue would want us to honor and that he would consider the highest tribute we could pay to his lifetime of public service imperfections and all. Thank you. Thank you, Liz, so much. Uh, that was absolutely fascinating. And I have many questions, but I'm going to uh, take them from our audience to start with. Uh, we have about 10 minutes. And are you ready for the first one? Sure. All right. Why is it that other advanced economies are able to address the issues of diversity and inclusiveness in urban housing, while in the U.S. while in the U.S. while in the U.S. Uh, this is seen as radical? Here I am thinking of the Netherlands and other Western European nations. Oh boy, that is a huge question. Uh, many books written to try to figure out uh, how we how why we have gone down this path. Um, and I think a lot of it has to do with our suspicion of government and our uh, ties and, and emphasis on uh, local control. So that the resources that are really needed to, to, to really pull off that kind of investment uh, in, in, in the building of affordable housing um, the building of the infrastructure that we're seeing deteriorating really has to come from uh, more than one municipality or even a state. Because remember that in the United States and in many countries, a city and a state uh, cannot go into debt. Only the federal government can. So it becomes extremely difficult to balance the books and do the, those kinds of things. We end up putting on sales taxes or you know, adding to gas taxes. And that, those are the kind of proposals that come in as strategies for building more affordable housing. Um, you know, I, I, I think this is, a, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's very frustrating. I should point out though, that you know, many of the ideals that we might look to uh, in social democratic countries like Sweden, for example, um, where you know it, there was a lot of subsidized housing built, and many people still live in that today. There has been a retreat, um, you know, in this neoliberal age we are living in, um, from that robust government with its deep pockets. So that I wouldn't say that there are many places in the world even where government isn't as uh, suspect as in the United States, where we're seeing as much public investment as you know, I think it may take. And France would be an example of that, where you know, l'État is still uh, understood to be in control, and yet you know, there's still a lot of private sector activity, a lot of neoliberal kinds of policies under Macron and, and, and his group. Do you, uh, do you see this moment as ripe with the possibility for this kind of public investment and uh, in a moment when more than ever we need it? Sort of what are the lessons you've learned in doing this research that might uh, st uh, stimulate your optimism and show us a way forward? Well, and I'd like to answer this maybe on November 4th, but... Uh, <laughs> You know, because I do think it matters a lot who's in power in Washington. Um, you know, I, I I hoped and that when the uh, we went into this COVID crisis and all of its ramifications, that we were going to really change. And and the Atlantic piece that you referenced that I wrote does 
try to lay out some of the possibilities that, you know, for we were really honoring working class people who were on the front lines. We were learning how, not that all of us needed to learn this, many of us knew it, but it became, I think, more, um, more well known that many Americans didn't have adequate access to health care, that the affordable housing crisis was enormous, that there were many people living, you know, paycheck to paycheck. And without those paychecks, they were going to end up on the street if we didn't, you know, protect them from eviction. You know, it looked like society was coming, American society was coming to recognize these deep problems. As, as time has gone on, um, I, you know, I, I'm less optimistic, to be honest. Uh, I do think it will make a big difference to uh, if we get a Democratic president and Democratic Congress, because I do there's a, there's this greater confidence and uh, in the instrument of government, certainly on the Democratic Party side. But you know, we shouldn't, um, you know, uh, tease, you know, we we shouldn't forget that you know. The Democrats are neoliberals too, and there will be great uh, concern about raising taxes too much, about uh, not engaging the private sector in solving problems. And I should I should say that some of the things that have happened under the the pressures since the 1980s with the retreat of of, of government sort of funding, some of it has been positive. Um, in that we're, to the extent that there is activity building affordable housing in many American cities, it is sponsored by nonprofits, community development corporations, community land trusts. There's been a lot of experimentation in recent years to try to figure out how to solve these very deep problems. So I don't want to see those things go away. I think we can see from the Logue experience that, you know, there are, you can go too far with you know, top-down management. Um, but I do think many of these nonprofits spend an enormous amount of their time trying to scrape together the funding that they need to do their work. And were there more federal funding available? Were there more uh, Section 8 vouchers available to people? Was there more, more was public housing that does still exist and is much prized, there are long, long waiting lists to get in it. If that was bring, if there was funding to, to properly maintain public housing, we would be in a lot better place. Okay. So cities like Austin, Dallas, Phoenix, and Atlanta are becoming increasingly popular. However, these are sprawling living, sprawling areas as well. The question is, do you think our problem regarding sprawl and city development will become worse? Hmm. Well, there are some, that, that, these are such good questions. I mean, first of all, you know, those are city, there are cities that are doing well and those are Sunbelt versions. We, there are also uh, non-Sunbelt cities, uh, Boston, for example, um, Washington, DC uh, are prospering. And then of course we have the Detroit's and the Newark's and the Cleveland's, um, you know, I could go on of, of troubled cities. I mean, it is interesting that many of these Sunbelt cities um, are of a different sort, you know, a Houston, a Phoenix. Uh, it's interesting though, that some of them have recognized the problems that they have created with sprawl and are introducing fairly late in their development, some version of mass transit. Um, it may be bus lanes and not, you know, uh, and certainly not subways, um, but you know I think we are we're seeing the, the consequences for the for climate change. Of uh, people are getting very frustrated with the amount of time they are spending. In fact, we're learning that many people are discovering that working from home means they're saving all this time. Right. Um, so you know there have been Houston has put in some transit, Phoenix has put in some transit. So you know I do think it's 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 a logical solution. Um, but, you know, Americans don't take advantage of mass transit to the extent that people in many other countries do. Uh, so if you've been to Asia, or you look at, you go in Europe, in London, in Paris, um, you see, first of all, you know, incredibly well-functioning, um, newly renovated uh, systems. You know, I've been to Seoul recently, to Hong Kong, 
mm -hmm. Tokyo, you know, you, you see that there are parts of this kind of this world where yeah. mass transit is really dependent on. Um, and, you know, the Southwest may be, and the Sun Belt may be an extreme, but in general, even in a city like Boston, which is small and much denser in its development, Bostonians still don't use mass transit to the extent that they should. And part of that is because we have not invested in updating our mass transit. It's still very much a system that was built decades ago when the city's development looked very different. Um, so, you know, again, I go back to the need for us to invest in public goods. We are just about at the end. I'm going to uh, ask you one final question. Is there an echo or can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. One final question, shifting slightly. I want to ask about uh, what it was like for you to try to write this sort of twin, these twin stories of an individual and a moment in American history and US history. And specifically as a, as a writer, did you have a model of a great sort of social biography that was standing before you? Sort of how did your own process proceed? Uh, I would say it was hard. Um, you know, I'm not by nature a narrative writer. So uh, that was a challenge, though I had the chronology of a life to help me along. Um, I often struggled with how much context, how much personal life. Um, I, I came up with um, a rule for myself that I would only really tell the reader aspects of, of, of Logue's life that I felt really were important for understanding his work. Mm -hmm. um, but I worried that, you know, that, that a, a, many readers would say, well, I want to know about his marriage and I want to know about his children. And, you know, I, so, and I did after I, Alice and others, some other friends uh, read drafts and did encourage me at certain points to tell a little bit more about, you know, uh, what was going on in the in that in the Logue household, which I which I did do, but I usually tried to find ways of connecting it to my main story. Um, I had a, a harder time with um, balancing my my sort of identity with him versus my critical perspective as an historian and a biographer. Um, I would keep veering from one direction to the other. I would catch myself feeling too sympathetic to him and then say, no, 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 you know, I, I, I really need to have a, to, to, to reckon, to tell the reader the problems here, or I would find myself being too critical and, you know, not, um, you know, a, a giving him enough credit. I really strove to be balanced. Um, I have had many readers tell me that they end up recognizing his flaws and the problems in what he did, but feeling some empathy with him and some connection. And on that note, I will say that we've come to the conclusion of this incredibly interesting event. If you were all sitting in the IHC conference room, these books, I think you can see the book, would be waiting for you to buy, but you're just going to have to get this fabulously balanced book, which you do sort of hit that middle range, I think, detached empathy, critical empathy. Um, I will thank you for such an inspiring talk. Thanks to our audience members uh, for attending. Please do take a minute to fill out the post-event survey and to sign up for our mailing list so that you can receive information about future events. And good night to everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much for hosting me.